Hello, my name's Limbalo. I'm a trustee of both the RTS and uh, Wildstream, so I'm delighted to be chairing the Q&A this evening. And it's a real thrill to have the production team from Frozen Worlds with us. So please welcome to the stage Silverback co-founder, series and executive producer, Dr. Keith Scully producer and director of this episode of Our Planet, uh, Sophie Lanfear, principal photographer, Jamie McPherson, and researcher, Ollie Scoley. <laughs> now, we have about half an hour to discuss some of the, uh, wow. some of the issues in this film. Um, I'd like to talk to you for about 20 minutes and then take some questions from the floor, because I'm sure there are lots of questions um, uh, from the audience as well. Um, congratulations, Keith. Extraordinary impact and influence. Um, can we just go back to the very beginning of when did you actually start talking about this series? You've got 30 years or more of making extraordinary series about the natural world, many with Sir David. So when did you actually start thinking about how you might do this one and why Netflix? Well, it's probably something... Um, I, I, I formed this company, Silverback, with Alistair Fothergill, and Alistair had done the original Blue Planet and Planet Earth and Frozen Planet. And um, at that time, I think I was his boss, which was a very unfortunate place to be. I think you were my boss once as well. I think I might have been your boss once. But anyway, um, we, we formed the company, and we always wanted to make another big um, landmark show. But um, we'd been, we were so aware of the destruction of nature that we thought it was inappropriate to actually to make one that didn't actually tackle head-on the issues of our modern world. And so when we formed the company, this is probably about seven years ago, um, we had a plan that we were going to do this. And um, we went through quite a long development period, um, but, but, but then sort of honed down on this idea and um, formed an agreement with Netflix to actually make it. We also, a fundamental thing we decided to do, if we were going to tackle... Um, the environmental issues, we needed to make sure we had our facts right. And so we teamed up with WWF from the word go as well, because they, every two years, do a thing called the Living Planet Report, which is basically an audit of what's going on in the world. And that really formed the, the factual spine um, to what we were going to actually do. And that is that combination, actually, of um, WWF and Netflix, I think, that turned out to really help us to achieve it. So how long ago was that? When did that start? Well, we actually, I, th I think we got the commission um, about five years ago, um, making the show. These shows always take about four years to make. Um, you need a year, really, to research and find all the stories. You need at least two years to shoot it, because in, in wildlife, um, one season can always go badly wrong on you and the world throws up all sorts of... Nature throws up all sorts of things, and you show up, and it's not quite as you expect. So we always like to have at least two seasons. Um, and then, as you guys probably all know, it takes about a year to put a series like this to, together in post-production. So <clears throat> it's a delicate balance, isn't it, to actually inform and entertain and, you know, allow us to revel in the glorious cinematography. I'll come to you in a minute, Jamie. Just fantastic, fantastic photography. It's a delicate balance to get that right, but actually punch hard with the messages. And I guess just coming to you, uh, Sophie, you, you're responsible for that film. Mm. Um, where did you start? With the walrus story? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, it started a bit, well, being asked to work on it. Um, uh, it was, yeah, the premise of a conservation series, I think, the heart of Bristol, where, you know, this stuff comes from. Um, we all are so passionate about con conservation, so when Keith and Alistair asked me to produce, it was my first film. Um, and I, I have a passion for the polls. I'd done a lot of work in the polls previous to this show. And... Um, they asked me, and I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. And I just thought, I'm the last producer to the table. I'm the youngest. I'm the, it's my first film. I'll never get it. Uh, and I said, I, I want to do Frozen Worlds. And they're like, great. No one wants to do that film. <laughs> so I was like, perfect. Um, and then I, I set about watching pretty much everything to watch on the polls, every documentary that had ever been. And what I realised was, was that the really important message of our time is actually to differentiate between sea ice and land ice. And this film, the narrative, was then spun of sea ice. Um, and the important thing to learn about sea ice that I hope came across in the film is that 
um, the first section explains how sea ice works. It explains that it's an ecosystem, it's this upside down Serengeti world where you have, you know, the ice produces life and it supports a great abundance of life and that abundance far from the shores like South Georgia, these sub-Antarctic islands that are exquisitely full of life, all depend on this sea ice system. And then the final kind of act, if you like, of the film is that when the sea ice disappears, the impact that has, not just for the animals that live there, but for the planet as a whole because of the albedo impact and the effect that, you know, from a selfish point of view, these ice worlds, these frozen worlds are protecting us from climate change. So if we lose those, we stand to lose not just these magnificent animals, we stand to lose a lot more. And that, to me, it was sort of the narrative I wanted to tell. Um, and Jamie and Ollie helped bring that alive um, in the film. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but just to go back to the walruses, <laughs> if I may. <laughs> What did you know about that story before you actually went out and started researching it and seeing whether you could capture it? Because that in itself is extraordinary, the fact that you mm. captured it. You know, uh, so in your world of natural history filmmaking and conservation, is that a well-known story? It wasn't, no. Um, <clears throat> I'd worked with Russian biologists before, and they're a phenomenal, I mean, remarkable group of field biologists. It, they, they spend months in the field studying. And this one scientist I was put in touch with through an old contact... Um, called Anatoly Kochnev, and he'd been su he's been studying for 35 years these, these walrus haul-out sites. And it was a bit tricky, translation, because um, I think it was pretty much done through Google Translate. Um, and there was a bit of... Uh, <laughs> I think the, yeah, some of the words came out like Air Force, and I was thinking, what's this word in Russian that translates to Air Force? I don't understand what that means. Anyway, um, we kind of got the gist of what he was saying, and we were looking at... We wanted to see polar bear interactions. We're thinking, oh, it'd be great to have a sequence of bears. And Wrangell Island used to be this place where they attacked these haul out sites. He's like, that doesn't happen anymore. And I was like, okay. He said, but I did discover the largest gathering of walrus on the planet. And I was like, okay, tell me more about that. And basically, he, the, in 2009, he discovered this site which over 100,000 walrus every year are turning up at this site, um, which he believed to be nearly three quarters of the world population of these walrus. And that was, the site had had aerial photography in the past, and the numbers are fivefold what they used to be, and it was linked to sea ice. So I was like, well, that's, he sent me some pictures through of, of that site, and I was like, well, we have to film that, you know, it's incredible. Um, and then the cliffs, which is a story we totally weren't expecting no, at all. I mean, I'd, I'd heard reports of, I'd seen very basic footage of old footage of Alaska, of them sort of tumbling down verges. Mm -hmm. But what we never expected, and we, turned, we were all pretty shocked that, A, a walrus can get to a top of an 80-metre cliff. I mean, that in itself, we didn't expect. Um, and then we watched them for days. You know, we were kind of there from dawn till dusk, watching these walrus, and they were teetering on the edge, teetering on the edge. And then when the walrus leave the beach to go and feed, they sense that. And because they're so sociable, they all want to follow. And they were just, I mean, that was yeah, they walk off. the yeah. tragic thing. It was heartbreaking and shocking at the same time was they don't know how to get down, you know, and they basically walk themselves off. Some make it down. You know, there were a few groups of maybe 20 walrus that actually worked out how to go back the way they came, but the vast majority, you know, as you saw, yeah, it was horrendous. So let's unpack that a little bit with um, Jamie and Ollie, if we may, because it is an extraordinary sequence to have captured. So you're yeah. on a recce and you're looking at it and you're going, wow. Okay. We were there to film it, yeah, we were there. So what, so what next? What next? Well, as I've said, they built up and they were on the beaches and the scene on the beach is, you know, unbelievable. Like, we'd never expect it to be anything like that. We thought we'd see a few thousand, but 100,000 on the beach is just unbelievable. And then when they're on the cliffs... You want to see that, you know, you go there to film them tumbling down to show this polar bear interaction or something. You want something dramatic to happen, but as soon as it started to happen and you've seen the images, it was just horrendous. Like, we didn't want to film it. You've got to film it, take the images home and show people what is actually happening, but it's definitely the most horrendous thing I've ever seen and filmed by, yeah. So where were you? Where were you and um, what sort of lens were you using? How far um, away? We were at the base of the cliffs, not in their way, trying to stay out of the way so we're not moving them with a 1,500mm lens, so um, quite a long way away, but, um, yeah, close enough. And meanwhile, enough. Ollie... And then watching. Ollie, yes, yeah, absolutely. Ollie, the Sophie. Ollie you, were, you were there with some new kind of kit to, yeah. to capture something 
up by the, the walruses themselves. Yeah, no, definitely. So we, um, drones obviously came out right at the sort of beginning of, um, of the filming for this, this series. And, um, uh, and yeah, and the drone for, for this was obviously really key because you could see the sort of big spectacle of it and also quite how precarious where they, where they were placed. Um, but yeah, but we were about a kilometer away, um, really just staying back as far as we could from it, just to try and make sure that the drone was as far away from the walrus as possible. Um, and yeah, so we could kind of see more of the kind of big scale of it, whereas these guys were um, in a position to see more of the kind of close up. So is that the first time you used drones in that, that kind of uh, environment? Yeah, we Do they of... work easily there? Not really, <laughs> no. Um, they're kind of designed for like... Uh, California. Yeah. California, yeah. sort of like mid, mid latitudes and stuff, and yeah, they don't like weddings. I find them. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's slightly different to the war site, but um, yeah, no, they they're basically they're not really built to be in the high Arctic or the high Antarctic, and they're certainly not built to be cold. So um, in the Russian site, we actually got the uh, the local guys to run a, a power cable uh, from sort of the nearest town all the way out to us, just so we could get a, a little heater to to keep the drone warm and and fly it. So yeah, it's not the easiest uh, logistical thing. Um, meanwhile, watching this sort of ridiculous spectacle happening at the same time so yeah it's definitely challenging so what did you think when you saw the the footage mr series producer it's shocking it's still shocking it, it, it's a it's an image well it's interesting because these guys came back and i could tell something wasn't right they, they they there was a kind of a palpable sort of that excitement where you know you filmed something mm -hmm. which is important and remarkable but there's also this kind of they were shell-shocked and when I saw the rushes, I thought, okay, I get it. Um, and, um, and we had a long, hard think about what do we show, what do we do, and um, we hope we got the balance right, because um, it's, it's a scene, it's sort of gone viral now. I, I went to LA last week, as you do, and um, I was, <laughs> got to the immigration guy, and he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I make wildlife films. Who do you make them for? And, Disney and Netflix um, did this, Our Planet. Were you there with the walrus? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, we've, you know, yeah. it's the immigration, and then he wants a long old chat. I, I'm his best friend, and you know, there's that LAQ, you know, <laughs> you know you've, you've probably been there. Um, so you, you kind of, the thing has gone viral, it has become a symbol of climate change, and, and so, I guess it's the right thing to have shown it, but um, yeah, I also watch Gogglebox, and you know, you watch that, and you think, "My God, we've done that to so many people." So the shock, but there's also the revelation that everyone thinks we've got to do something about it. I guess that's the business. Um, and surely, you, I mean, you've made lots and lots of shows, hundreds and hundreds of hours of extraordinary um, films for the BBC, and the BBC is, of course, restrained uh, with editorial guidelines and balance. Netflix. Netflix, did that give you a freedom? Did you, did you feel it's, freer to campaign well, with no, a different that, broadcaster? I think Netflix is an interesting company, isn't it? Because it doesn't carry advertising. Um, so it's not beholden to um, people who, companies they might be advertising for. Um, and it doesn't, it's not governed by any governance charters mm. or what that. So, and when, when we met them, they did say, well, we're only interested in actually making good stuff to please an audience, and I thought, that's interesting. Uh, and they, they also said, we're very light touch editorially. We, we look for filmmakers, we, want, we like what you do, we want you to do what you want to, to, to do. And they, they stuck to their word on that. And um, it's, it's been a good journey. And um, I think they're now happy with what we did. So. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's something in that. <laughs> but it is a strong conservation message in this series and also the, the social media halo that goes around it, which I think is particularly interesting because that is a really campaigning part of the whole, the whole programme and the whole series. So did you, how, how, much, how much did you have to do with putting that together? So that's the viral campaign mm. that's gone round the world and back. That clip is in it. There are all sorts of other clips in it. Lots of really important facts about conservation, climate change, and, and why we should change our behaviour? Um, well, the producer that we worked with, the we called it the halo, internally we called it the halo. Yeah. <laughs> so we worked uh, with the producers on that, and so each producer had their habitat, and a, a core kind of conservation message was picked for each one. So resilience of forests, um, ice, sea ice in, in my film. Um, and then I think, I mean, it's the... It's such a wealth of knowledge, these films, and the things they address. And so 
those hearts to your film, the bits we can't tell and the bits we can't explain, um, they can. And I think they've done it in a really clever way by producing all sorts of different content to mm. support the main films and the the things we raise in those main films. Like, so many people since Frozen Worlds has gone out have contacted me to say, well, you know, what can we do? We've been so affected by Warus. You know, is there anything we can do realistically? And, I, and it's great to have that, to send them and say, you know, go to ourplanet.com, watch the films on there. Yes, there are things you can do. And it explains more of the human things and more of the solutions to the problems. And I think people have found that, you know, really useful and really helpful. Yeah, and that's what makes it so powerful, I guess. So, Jamie, yeah. um, is that the most powerful sequence you think you've ever shot? Yeah, by a long way. I mean, yeah, it was devastating to see. To experience it was horrendous, but as I said, it was, we wanted to bring the images home and show people, so it's, it had a big impact, and it's, it's, you know, it was on Gogglebox, uh, and they were horrified, as we were, but they, then it was amazing was that they wanted to know what they could do and they wanted to get involved, so, yeah, it was definitely worth it, and hopefully things will change. Um, just talk a little bit. It's not, it's not really easy working in that kind of environment, is it, actually, uh, below <laughs> the surface or on the surface. Tell us a little bit about how you prepare for that and what it's actually like working in those temperatures because, you know, we, we see the product of it and it looks fantastic and yeah. you make it look easy, but it's far from easy. Well, yeah, it depends where we are, really. I mean, it was a lot of places were cold and windy and cold, difficult. Cold, just give cold. cold. How cold cold? cold. Well, it's I don't know. It wasn't that Everyone bad. Says I mean, the cold. It's not it, cold. You've got to go there in the summer. For polar bears, you're there in the summer, so it's... Right. You know, it's a few no, degrees. Well, even you can wear a coat. You have to go in the water. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Ollie, you were in the water. <laughs> oh, yeah, if you're swimming. In the water, I mean, so you don't have to go swimming. <laughs> right. You didn't have didn't to shoot swimming. that beautiful well, we stuff swimming, with the penguins, yeah, Ollie. The no. So in, how in, cold in, is the water? Uh, minus 1.5 degrees C. So, yeah, okay. ish. Give or take, but yeah, it's, it's pretty cold. Um, yeah, no, it's yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's kind of a weird one because yeah, it's 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 painful. Like the second you get in, you get this kind of huge headache, and then your hands go in about five minutes, and then your feet go, and then sort of slowly, just everything just starts to sort of seize up and get colder. But um, but at the same time, you're kind of looking at this like um, these amazing spectacles and just being in that kind of underwater world and seeing the ice underwater and and, and seeing those penguins especially, which is amazing. So you're sort of distracted at the same time, but yeah, it's it's, it's definitely cold. So how long can you stay down there before it becomes dangerous? We got kind of better and better. I think the, the first time we lasted like kind of 20 minutes and then we'd get out. And then I think by the end, in, in one day, sort of cumulatively, cumulatively over the day, we did four hours. So that was, yeah, I was getting there. But yeah, but by the end of that, you're kind of done and just right. kind of want a beer and a Mars bar. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So are you signing off the risk assessment for this? Yeah, we... For we we <laughs> always looking for young blood. You know, <laughs> and, uh, There's no old blood left. And no. you know, it's well, it's attritional, but hey, that's telly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But the, the principal cinematographer is, is up on the surface with a really big coat on yeah. and yeah. gloves. Obviously. Yeah, he's been there before. Yeah. 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 Been there before. yeah. I was in a little cabin. Yeah, staying warm. Meanwhile, the French woman was in her speedos. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Free, I'm not joking. joking. Yeah, no, absolutely. You, you were telling me this before. You actually had a free diver under the water with you as well. Yes, yeah. yeah. Which means you can't use a dry suit, which is great because obviously you say dry and yeah. warm, yeah. you have to use a wet suit, which means you're obviously having that water kind of everywhere. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, that, that was, but that was kind of his technique for getting close to the penguins and stuff. Um, so it was, it was definitely good and it got us the, the footage, but um, it does make everything kind of twice as cold, which was a shame. But. Extraordinary. So before I open it up to, to the audience, just ask, ask a couple of quick que questions further. So Netflix are notoriously uh, quiet about their numbers. They don't, don't release mm. numbers. I mean, that's, that's not their business model. That's not, that's not how they do it. But I understand they actually have given you uh, some idea of the global audience for this series. Not just us, they actually made an announcement. Ah, which, right, okay. Which, which, which was Can help, you share helpful. that with us then, for those of us that didn't know? They're, I think certainly, they're certainly not going to tell me anything, because then I might tell you. And oh, what a shame. You because, um, no, it's... Um, so they... Uh, yeah, the, basically, they announced to the shareholders and what, that... Um, so we, they expect to hit the 25 million homes target by the end of a month. And they anticipate that a home is three to four people. So it's an audience of between 75 and 100 million. That's, that's globally in the first month. Um, but they actually expect to exceed that target quite a lot. And um, the, the, 
another bit, which I'm not going to tell you because you might write it down. But Go on, tell the, me. There's Go a, on, there's, there's a little there's, bit there. Anyway, <laughs> I think they're going to exceed that, that target. Anyway, that by, number, by that, many? that number, who knows? But that number makes them happy. So, so that's good. And it seems to have reached a lot of people. And makes you happy, I would like yeah, to suggest. Yeah, no, it's good it's yeah. out there, yeah. 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 And it, I mean, it is remarkable that now you can just, overnight, you can broadcast to nearly all the countries of the world um, and, 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 and hit a very big audience. And then it's been fascinating... You know, with, with normal telly, your launch is everything, because it, it's there that weekend, mm -hmm. and then it's kind of gone. They're quite relaxed about launch, because launch isn't the thing. They say, actually, we'll, we'll have a look at it after a month, but we really judge something after six months, because that's, cause it's there all the time. So it's a completely different ecology of television. And the whole marketing campaign is more, they, they're really pushing it kind of now. Mm. Because they say if we push it too hard when it's not there, the audience, the Netflix audience, gets very irritated. Because they say, well, it's what is this thing? They want to watch it. And if it's not there, they say, oh, they're annoyed. So they, they put their big push, actually, in week one of after launch. And then they, then they keep on seeding it, um, depending on how the audience likes it. They can also spot audience trends, you know, what, what the audience is liking, what they're not liking, and then they can push the marketing around that. So it's, a, it's the new world. It's, it, is, it is very different. So what does Sir David think about that? He's very, he's very happy. Man. David's story is quite interesting. He's recounted this on a number of occasions, but um, he started, as you know, with, you know, when you could only go live. Yeah. There was no tape. And it was just live broadcasting. And to about, I don't know, what, 20,000 people in Surrey <laughs> when David kicked off. And now he's, you know, going to, you know, a, an audience of hundreds of millions globally straight away. And I, I think he, he's, he's been so interested in the whole evolution of broadcasting. He, I think he's very happy that he's been part and parcel of this as he sees as a, as a, as a, a brave new step. I think the other exciting thing that excited him was um, this is the first series, I think, that you can actually get in full 4K and high dynamic range. And it's the yeah. high dynamic range is the interesting bit. Um, people have been, I think, too worried about pixels for, for too long. But high dynamic range gives you colour. I don't know how many of you have kind of watched it on Netflix, but the, the colour and the range of colour is and contrast is absolutely spellbinding. It's a bit like when we went from SD to HD. I think this yeah. is the next step forward. And um, David's very excited about that because he started in black and white and, I don't know, a couple of lines of yeah. information. So, anyway. And fantastic for you, Jamie, as well, to, yeah, yeah, to, to, to work in, yeah. in that format. OK, we've got about uh, five or ten minutes more, so do we have some questions from the audience, please? There are some roving mics, I think. There's a hand at the back over there. Um, could I ask, how big is the, your crew on location? Hmm. Um, <laughs> it's... About this big. Yeah. <laughs> usually, <laughs> average, probably two to three. Uh, we usually have a camera person, someone from production, and then a, a field guide expert driver type person. Um, I think the biggest it got to on Frozen was about eight, with all the, the Antarctica yeah. on the boat, with the kind of people... <laughs> Boat Two crew, boat crew right. and then uh, a, a crew of six because we had the drone, we had the underwater, and we had the Jamie with the Cineflex. So they're they're small, they're very very small crews, and the reason for that is because, you know, we want to not scare animals. We want animals to behave naturally, and the smaller the crew, typically, generally, the smaller the crew, the less impactful the human presence, um, the better the behaviour. And so we kind of abide by those rules. You have minimum crew to kind of stick to that really. More questions. Hand up. Uh, There's a thank you very much, Dean. Uh, Phil. Okay. Can you divulge your shooting ratio? Are we allowed to know? <laughs> Is it a shooting ratio? Two to one. Oh, oh God. <laughs> well, in your much. head. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> Oh, God, it's, it's big. <laughs> it's quite high. Oh, what is it? I'm frozen. Do you know, it's... It, it's, it's a... Because... I, when I started, I remember we worried about shooting ratios a huge amount because it was so expensive, the yeah. film can, wasn't it? Um, and 
I guess now with digital, we don't worry as much about that because it's just storage cost. Uh, the, the, the impact really is, is now is just sort, sorting, going through the material mm. and finding the best bits, but that's usually pretty uh, obvious, isn't it? Yeah. I'd so we don't worry about, I don't, I, don't, I don't ask these guys to worry about shooting ratio and saying, but it's, 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 it's probably around about 1,000 to 1 yeah, it's and some. Thank you yeah. very much indeed, sir. <laughs> That's a very acceptable answer. <laughs> <laughs> There's a hand at the back over there, and lady in pink. There's a one over there, so two at the back. I was going to ask about the music, actually, um, and um, just a, a kind of a, a point that when it got to the way, the, the music's so intrinsic throughout, and then when it got to the walls bit, when they're coming off, it then stopped. And I was just, just kind of wondering what, how much role you had in the, the direction of the music mm. um, um, and how that worked. That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> I'd say that uh, the editor is a... Well, obviously, Stephen Price, who composed the score, is a large influence in that. But um, Nigel Buck, who edited this film, uh, who's the editor I really wanted to edit this film, um, editors are very different. Some work very closely to music, some not so. Um, the jury's out on what's better and what's not. Nigel happens to cut very tightly to music. Um, and he's incredible. Like, he pretty much cut that war sequence as is now. I mean, the first cut of it was almost mm. identical. He also put that pause in, so where it hits the rock and then it cuts out. Nigel had put that in. Obviously, we were working to temp music, not the final score. Now, composers hate that because they don't like to feel tied to... You know, if the, the tighter it is cut to music, they feel like they have nowhere to go. So it's a kind of, it's a, it's a balance. But I think Nigel, you know, that was carried through in, in how Steve then composed for it. And we kept that element because it worked so well. So the credit to that has to go to the editor, Nigel Buck. It's worth saying, actually, this all, all happens in Bristol, which um, makes me very proud. And I chair the RTS Centre in Bristol. But Nigel's a very well-known Bristol editor. Mm. It was all cut in the uh, facilities house, films at 59... Um, it's, it's extraordinary that um, it comes from Bristol. Mm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you had a hand up down here. The mic is on its way. <clears throat> here we go. Uh, hi. I just wanted to know, like, um, in general, do you guys have more of a filmmaking background or also with, like, wildlife, conservation, all that, or a balance of both? Uh, a mixture of both, really. I'd say science, but zoology, really. Yeah. Is our, background. Uh, uh, our formal background is all zoologists. Um, for, yeah. yeah, biological it's, science degrees. I think that, yeah, most, most people seem to come, f start there and um, then find the wonderful world of film and television and <laughs> never go back. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually fundamentally about a passion, isn't it, yeah. for the subject? Yeah, it's yeah. a real passion. Yeah, it was, yeah, assisting, it was a degree, but I didn't want to get a job doing that. I wanted to yeah. avoid getting a job, so this was the best way to do it. <laughs> become a cinematographer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, We've got about five minutes more. Some more questions? Oh, right, some more hands. Right, one, two, three. Shall we take that? So there's a mic over there to that. Shall we take these last three then? Okay. Um, I'm interested in the sound design and how much is recorded in the field and how much is done in Foley and put together. And my one sound design fact for this film. <laughs> so the elephant seal... The elephant seals on the beach oh, yeah. um, when they're fighting and that really incredible roar that they do. Because um, we, you know, we, we try to get natural sounds where we can and then others we have to obviously fit. Obviously, they're the correct species for what we're doing. Um, but that, there was nothing in the library of that. And I'd recorded um, a funny video of Jamie <laughs> trying to burp to make the <laughs> elephant seal burp. <laughs> and uh, the elephant seal replied to his burp. Yeah. And... It was basically, it was recorded on the iPhone. That was the best recording of an elephant seal. And that iPhone recording is the final thing in the show. Um, so, yeah, I, that taught me a lesson, actually. I was like, you know, if, if you ever need to record sound, just get it on your iPhone, because <laughs> it can work. Um, and then the narwhals, if you remember that sequence, we, put a, we had a hydrophone with us to record that. And that is the sound as we were filming. So, again, because you just can't cheat that sort of sound, it's, it's exactly what it was, um, and the most incredible sound. So it's, it is a combination of both. Obviously, you know, when you're filming from a helicopter, you can't record sound, and when you're so far away from an animal, you can't record sound. But we have this sound library of sounds that have been recorded on location in these environments. 
Um, so we draw upon that, you know, to get to get something authentic. Hi, I wanted to ask you about the camera kit because obviously having just two or three people on location presents sort of problems logistics. So what was your basic kit and what the lenses? The basic kit that isn't very basic. Um, I we were using a Cineflex, which is a gyro stabilized camera that's designed to go on a helicopter, and we had taken it off the helicopter and fitted it to various things. So a tractor vehicle to film the polar bears. So in that, I'm op the whole thing is is remotely operated. So we've got a driver driving, and then I'm operating the camera. Uh, we also put that on a beach buggy, which Ollie pushed around to film the penguins, because it gives you a stabilised image, no matter how much it's bumping about. And that's got a red camera with a 1,500mm lens in it. So that was our sort of standard for most of the, the penguins porpoising, is the same camera on a boat, on a crane, alongside them. And then the aerials was a combination of helicopter with the same camera. Um, and then the drone stuff that Ollie was doing, and then underwater. Yeah, we, we sort of have sort of other sort of smaller cameras that really just form the kind of edges around what Jamie was doing with the Cineflex. So that the bread and butter of the film is 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 the Cineflex and the gyro stabilized feel, and then drones and bits of underwater and bits of other camera techniques we use to sort of support that really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. So one final question here. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, with regards to it being a very sort of eco conservation heavy message, um, whether there were any particular steps that you took either in pre-production or on location to sort of minimise the impact of the production on, you know, essentially a story you're telling. Mm. I, I should probably kick off from the company point of view. Um, we, we're affiliated, there's this group called Albert that some okay. of you may know, we're still back as part and parcel of that. Um, we were also really very mindful of, because we were in partnership with WWF about impact. So, yeah, the, there is a thing that if you want to show the natural world, uh, you have to travel to the four corners of the earth to, to do that. Um, but, you know, we, we offset our carbon and whether what people think about carbon offsetting, that's a, that's a debate in itself. But I think we've tried to do what is right. We've tried to think through what's going on. But I think at the end of the day, the equation we've had to make, and I've certainly personally had, 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 had to make, is, is, is the environmental cost of making the film worth bringing the story back to enough people to bring about change. And on that basis, I'm happy with what we've done. But it is a, it is a, it, it is a judgment call. Because there is no doubt that filmmaking is an expensive business. Um, and if it's expensive, it, it, it has has an environmental cost, especially a high carbon cost. But you uh, talk about the, more, the, the sort of details. Yeah, the day-to-day -day of that. I, like you say, Albert is a really great thing, actually. Um, and th they come to the company and they train us and they make you really think about everything from kind of office to going out to flights to, um, you know, you trying to use solar energy to recharge batteries. And so when you're designing a shoot, if you like, you know, we always look into our carbon footprint, we're very aware of it, we try where possible to reduce it, if that means cooperating with other productions to shoot share so that there's not two crews going out, there's one, we do that. Um, so we do look at ways in which we can reduce it. Um, like Keith said, I think now the good thing is that things have turned more to the conservation, you know, the value in the footage you're bringing back is, is greater and you should really be asking yourself, well, then should we only be working on conservation value films rather than films that don't address that, which may be, you know, the carbon isn't so... You know, how do you sum that up? I don't know. You can do it from a personal level, and personally, I now feel that for a series that I, I want to work on and be involved with, it needs to, to put that educational message out to a broad audience and be justified in that sense, because it is very much something I think about on a daily basis. Definitely. And also, like, you know, you write from a personal level, vegetarianism, all of these things, eat a lot less meat. It does working and living and breathing this message for four years has definitely changed me. Yeah, it's totally. changed you. Well, you see it every day, everywhere you go, it's everywhere's changing. So, yeah, you can't help be influenced by it. Yeah. yeah. And so you do what you can. And, and, you know, I'd encourage everyone to do it because I think the thing with climate change and all these things is people feel overwhelmed by it. They feel that, what can I do to make a difference? And actually, people can do a lot and they don't think they can. And that's one of the messages of the series is actually, you know, you can do stuff and it will make a difference. And so we just need to kind of be positive about that and not negative about it. 
Um, but it's a good question because it is something that's definitely on our minds constantly. Um, and it's a good way to end, really. And, and just to, to give Wildscreen a plug, because actually that's exactly what Wildscreen does. So um, have a look at Wildscreen and, uh, and see how they uh, encourage the debate about actually capturing this wonderful content about the natural world and how we balance that with them. Um, is actually looking at our impact and minimising that impact.